broadly speaking, uh, Namjoon Peck's work has striven to realize more capacious, more humane ways of relating to technology. Today, I'd like to discuss two installation pieces, Electronic Superhighway, Continental US, Alaska, Hawaii, and Megatron Matrix, both from 1995 and on permanent display in the Smithsonian American Art Museum to show how the human capacity for retention has been constituted technologically through moving image archiving. Electronic Superhighway is made up of 51 video feeds, each transmitted to a bank of monitors dedicated to a US state. They feature archival footage drawn from commercial, industrial, and other sources, as well as from Peck's previous video work that showcase both stereotypical and unknown aspects of each state. The 215 monitors that make up Megatron Matrix display found footage as well, appropriated images that depict hand-drawn cartoon characters, Korean folk dancing, national flags, images from the Seoul Olympics in 1988, and abstract computer graphics, among many other visual representations. Here I attempt to show how these pieces by Peck seem to model the capacity for human consciousness to recall the past, to remember histories that have and have not been lived through communication technologies that function as prostheses to human consciousness. As scholars have noted, Peck's work has been interpreted to anticipate the incorporation of imaging and archival technologies into the everyday lives of human beings. In this regard, we may consider the ways in which the quote, electronic superhighway has already transformed the status and dissemination of knowledge, which in turn has radically altered the criteria for legitimizing knowledge claims themselves. Ready access to the internet on smartphones and mobile devices has trained their human users to put little effort into recalling names, facts, and histories because all knowledge can be quickly retrieved with a simple search. Peck's work provides a critical view on these transformations, showing how the outsourcing of memory to electronic images removes ontological differences that have traditionally marked spatial and temporal distinctions between near and far and now and then. After leaving Korea for Japan and West Germany, Peck eventually settled in New York in 1964, becoming a naturalized American citizen in 1976. His interest in the relationship between humans and technology is evident early on in his career, in the work he produced soon after arriving in the US. In collaboration with the engineer Shuya Abe, Peck built an anthropomorphic automaton called Robot K486, named after Mozart's 18th piano concerto in B-flat, constituted of aluminum wires, old speakers, and hinges barely holding the parts together, the robot looks as if it is about to collapse at any moment. The piece is modeled after a fragile human body rather than the prototypical super being of science fiction whose presence implicitly poses a threat to mortal man. The vulgar gracelessness of robot K456 not only refutes but also cheekily mocks the precious elegance of the Mozart concerto. Yet because of its clumsiness and seeming vulnerability, the robot invites others to mingle and interact with it as it lumbers along city streets. Remotely controlled, it could be commanded to wave, rotate its breasts, bow slightly, tilt its square head and excrete beams. From various speakers mounted on its body, a recording of JFK's 1961 inauguration is played mischievously mocking the momentousness of the celebrated president's speech. In 1982, during a retrospective of Peck's work at the Whitney Museum in New York, robot K456 was rolled down Madison Avenue and while crossing 75th Street was struck by a Honda Civic driven by the artist William Anastasi. Recalling a fluxus happening Peck called this stage performance the first accident of the 21st century and had footage of it broadcast on a local CBS affiliate. When a reporter asked what it all meant, the artist responded, according to John Handhart, that, quote, he was practicing how to cope with the disaster of technology in the 21st century. He also noted that the robot was 20 years old and had not had its bar mitzvah, 
In the 20th century, Peck seemed to anticipate the era of humans encountering technology in the 21st, of scooters, food delivery robots, and self-driving cars traversing sidewalks and roads, and with it, the rising possibility of accidents between organic and inorganic beings. He provokes observers to consider the preconditions for coping with technological disaster and to critically rethink the relationship between intelligent technologies and the human body. Peck's playful first catastrophe of the 21st century draws attention to the possibility of coexisting with machines, which potentially have the capacity to think, not as ontologically other to the everyday life of humans, but as intentional beings that may somehow be sympathized with. Is it possible to mourn for the fragile, incapacitated robot that has been hit by an automobile driven by a human who intends to run it down? To what extent are concepts such as guilt, innocence, and debt, concepts that have traditionally revolved around the moral human being, relevant in understanding the ethics of such accidents? If Peck compels us to think critically about the relationship between humans and technology through the staging of an accidental event, the event of art itself seems to be at issue in his TV bra for living sculpture from 1964. Constructed from two small video screens, a strip of vinyl, wires, and plexiglass boxes, the piece is a functional brassiere intended for use by his collaborator, the cellist Charlotte Mormon. As Mormon wears the bulky piece, she plays music by Bach and other classical composers on the cello, and the two screens covering her breast show a live television broadcast. In turn, the music produced by her cello modulates and disrupts the images shown on the screens. In the performance notes for the TV bra, Peck writes, quote, the real issue implied in art and technology is not to make another scientific toy, but how to humanize the technology and the electronic medium, which is progressing rapidly, too rapidly. By bringing new technologies into the tradition of classical music, a tradition that has primarily featured acoustic instruments, Peck seems to be affirming the possibility of thinking video as an expressive medium alongside the cello. Moreover, TV bra allows television images to be incorporated into the cloistered realm of classical music, music that is often considered non-representational and abstract, thus breaking down boundaries between art and life. The affirmation of such hybrids and material contaminations seems to be derived from the aesthetic aims that underpin John Cage's Four Minutes and 33 Seconds from 1952, a work that implores listeners to hear noises such as coughing, bodies shuffling in seats, faint noises outside the concert hall, and other incidental sounds is integral to the performance. In a similar vein, Peck's technological bra as a kind of found object is integrated into the cello music that Mormon performs as the artist writes, quote, TV brassiere for living sculpture is one sharp example to humanize electronics and technology by using TV as a bra, the most intimate belonging of human being. We will demonstrate the human use of technology and also stimulate viewers, not for something mean, but stimulate their fantasy to look for the new imaginative and humanistic ways of using our technology. Both the cello and the TV bra bring about the artistic event and both may be thought of as prosthetic technologies that are incorporated by and extend the capacities of the human body. Commenting on Peck's relationship to Cage, Edith Decker Phillips writes that though Cage understood pianos, radios, and audio technology as ways of making music, quote, Peck also saw them as objects with visual qualities. Instead of thinking the classical cello as having a more rarefied status than the small screen that broadcasts local television feeds, both become equally significant in Peck's work for the invocation of the aesthetic experience. In this vein, Peck's electronic superhighway takes the aims of robot K456 and TV bra for living sculpture further by collapsing distinctions between high and low art while integrating technology more closely with the potentialities of the body. In doing so, the sculptural visual piece shows how our relationship to archiving technologies 
profoundly informs our everyday knowledge about the United States. On encountering Electronic Superhighway on the third floor of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, one is immediately struck by the massive scale of the installation that affects the viewer regardless of whether the piece is seen up close or from afar. Four and a half meters high, the piece consists of separate video channels, one for each state, plus an additional channel for the District of Columbia, transmitted to 336 television screens mounted on a large scaffold. In front of the bank of screens are a series of neon lights that function as an overlay, delineating the borders of the states and allowing the totality of the map to appear. Indeed, Peck's piece raises a number of ontological questions introduced by Jasper Johns's painting, Map, from 1961. Is it a found object, symbol, simply a sign, or perhaps all three at once? but heightens uh, the tenuous ontological status of art with history with the introduction of mesmerizingly distractive video images. The content of each video feed is a series of banal images as they would be known nationally or even globally. The Iowa Presidential Caucuses, New York's Empire State Building, images of potatoes for Idaho. For three states, Missouri, Kansas, and Mississippi, Clips from three well-known films are featured, Meet Me in St. Louis, The Wizard of Oz, and Showboat. Their titles are explicitly labeled uh, with a wooden sign. As one approaches electronic superhighway, one may attempt to overcome the experience of immersion induced by its considerable size and focus on a specific state to see what images Peck has chosen to feature. The state of California, for example, features a quickly changing montage of images of the Golden Gate Bridge and O.J. Simpson leading a fitness aerobics class, among others. The viewer may shift their focus toward a state where they have lived or visited, such that the images, say of the Kentucky Derby, remind the spectator of a past moment when they were physically there. Or they may focus on states where they have never been, such as Oregon, whose screens feature images of mountains, outdoor sports, and the phone number of the state's tourism commission. Audio speakers embedded between the monitors carry the sounds derived from a few of the image feeds, including Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech from Selma from 1965 and the soundtracks to the Hollywood films just mentioned. The visitor to the exhibit then may turn toward the small screens that make up the feed from Washington, DC, which features a closed circuit transmission from a camera pointed at the viewer. Standing in the Smithsonian Museum in front of Peck's work in a gesture toward intimate proximity and self-reflexivity, thus recalling Vito Conchi's video work, viewers see themselves seen as they approach these monitors. For all the other states uh, physically distant from the viewer, he or she may come to realize that the contents of all 50 feeds have been derived largely from the archives of film and television history, the collective memory that constitutes the imagined community of US national identity. Indeed, an identity that is not of Peck's birth, but one that has been acquired for him through naturalization. A few states feature footage of Peck's friends and collaborators, such as John Cage in Massachusetts, Charlotte Mormon in Arkansas, she was born in Little Rock, and Merce Cunningham in Washington state. They reflect not so much the memories and associations of the US populace, but those of Peck himself, appropriating extended clips from his previous work. The images for Washington state are derived from Peck's 1978 single channel video piece, Merce by Merce by Peck. In it, Cunningham's image is doubled and tripled and his body is composited on artificial and natural backdrops. Nevertheless, given the copious numbers of monitors and Peck's penchant to combine high art and popular culture in bewildering montages, it is difficult at first to ascertain how to approach electric superhighway. Standing back from it, the effect of the map's entirety is overwhelming, even sublime. But when one steps forward to examine the details of a particular channel feed, the effect is again engulfing because most images appear so quickly, shift perspectives so rapidly that the viewer is unable to fully take them in. Just as the, as the content of the feeds are derived from the archive of popular and Peck's individual memory, 
so does their disorienting form has a precedence in the artist's oeuvre. We might draw our attention in this regard to another work by Peck called Global Groove, a 30 minute single channel video piece from 1973. It begins with a solemn prediction about the future of video and broadcast television that sets the tone for what will follow. Quote, this is a glimpse of a video landscape of tomorrow when you will be able to switch on any television on the earth and TV guides will be as fat as the Manhattan telephone book. It then continues with a dizzying montage of archival footage from high and popular art sources, similar in this regard to electronic superhighway or performances by Cage and Allen Ginsberg in the Living Theater, commercials from Japanese television, and heavily manipulated footage of a dancing couple. An image featuring the head of Richard Nixon is psychedelically manipulated with a large magnet, recalling Peck's prepared televisions, the first of which was conceived in 1975 with his found sculpture, Magnet TV. Like robot K456, Global Groove seems to be put together almost haphazardly with discarded materials and awkward montages of images resembling perhaps the imagery that accompanies a Norebang track. The video's non-digetic soundtrack blasts Mitch Ryder's Devil with a Blue Dress On, which is juxtaposed with spoken word text by Cage, Mormon, and Peck. Global Groove celebrates a brave new world in which television viewers are bombarded with nonlinear series of images and sounds that appear to the viewer as if he or she were switching quickly between countless channels. Alternatively, it is as if Peck's video itself were a manifestation of a kind of media consciousness that brings together disparate cultures and communities through their visual synchronization. In a 1974 review that appeared in the New York Times, Hilton Kramer writes of the rapid rhythms that global groove found foregrounds in regard to the video medium. What is important above all in this medium is the pace at which the screen projects and devours its images. It is a pace that deliberately subverts any empathetic response we may bring to a specific image, for no matter how compelling or boring a particular moment may be, it is cut to a rhythm that negates our interest in it in order to fasten all attention on the rhythm itself. This is, in other words, a medium in which representational images are used for the purposes of kinetic abstraction. The wild graphic manipulations, quick cuts, and jarring juxtapositions featured in Global Groove flash by quickly, calling attention not to individual signs and symbols, but to their torrential onrush through the experience of mesmerizing commotion. Electronic Superhighway clearly draws from the dizzying form of Global Groove, multiplying its single channel by 50 across a map of the continental United States. Through this array of screens, one attention on any one area or moment of the piece constantly shifts because the montage of images that make up a single state compels not attentive contemplation, but instead a highly distractive form of spectatorship. Walter Benjamin famously wrote of concentration and distraction to describe the consumption of art in modernity and noted that they, quote, form popular opposites, which may be stated as follows. A man who concentrates before a work of art is absorbed by it. In contrast, the distracted mass absorbs the work of art. And you know, as, as we know from Benjamin, um, it's, it's uh, cinema that is the, the most um, kind of advanced form of this distracted form of spectatorship. So indeed, uh, Peck's electronic superhighway appeals particularly in the almost instinctual recognizability of its imagery to the preoccupied museum visitor who nevertheless seeks both engagement and immediacy. Experience of the installation may be overwhelming, yet the piece does not compel the viewer to adapt to its aura of aesthetic experience. It instead addresses attendees through its haphazard form, which has nevertheless become increasingly familiar in a media environment offering countless channels, each of which demand individual attention. Whether electronic superhighway is seen from afar where a viewer can experience the ceaseless chaos of its 51 video feeds or from up close where a person's attention on a single feed constantly shifts in accordance with its rapid rhythm and kinetic abstraction, 
Peck's piece appeals to a collective archive of images, loose associations, and radically disjointed memories that constitute the idea of America. In its appropriation of archival sounds and images, electronic superhighway may remind us of what philosopher Bernard Stiegler calls tertiary memory. Stiegler's account of tertiary retention is perhaps his most important contribution to the phenomenology of time and ultimately to what he calls the, quote, invention of the human. It is a form of recall that has become increasingly crucial in our age of cinema and the internet and describes how we can recall events that have not been experienced personally. These technologies of memory and archiving have nevertheless come to function unproblematically as artificial extensions of the capacity of the human being to remember the experiences of others. In volume three of his sprawling work, Technics and Time, he writes that, quote, tertiary retention is in the most general sense, the prosthesis of consciousness without which there would be no mind, no recall, no memory of a past that one has, no person lived, no culture. A viewer may have never attended the Kentucky Derby, seen O.J. Simpson's aerobics class in person, or been it to Selma to hear Martin Luther King Jr. speak in 1965, but the images of these events recorded onto film and video allow a person to see them take place in the present moment, yet from a temporal and spatial distance. As a form of prosthetic memory manifests in the merging of technological and human capacities, tertiary retention exists as a supplement to primary and secondary retention. Stiegler draws on Edmund Husserl's phenomenological analysis of a melody unfolding in time and these two forms of retention it compels. As a temporal object, a melody is perceived in the immediate moment following the act of hearing when hearing emerges into aesthetic experience or when immediate perception develops into past reflection. Primary re retention takes place at precisely the moment that the now passes into the just now, eventually becoming a then. In addition, secondary retention names the capacity to recall an event at a much later time, the act of recalling a moment that already took place but is no longer present to perception. When a person sings a melody heard the day before, the act calls on the individual to reconstruct the temporal object seemingly out of thin air, to experience it again through its reconstruction. The singing of a familiar melody is an act of remembering and a re-embodiment of the past that also takes place in the here and now. Because the phenomenological method disregards all phenomena that cannot be directly experienced by consciousness, Husserl is unable to describe the experience of tertiary retention beyond its primary and secondary forms. Tertiary retention remains unique in that its existence depends on recording technologies such as writing, film, and video. By representing past moments that have not been lived personally, these technologies give credence to the existence of histories, of cultures, and of times and places that have not been lived Stiegler's most interesting insight into the phenomenon of memory is to show that in the age of mechanical reproducibility, the strict division between primary and secondary retention delineated by Husserl dissolves and is shown to be subsumed in tertiary memory. As a technics of historicity or as a form of archie writing that constitutes the very notion of pastness, the act of recall is deeply informed by mechanical reproduction such that the meaning of pastness and of recall themselves are already technological. Consciousness, Stiegler writes, is, quote, always in some fashion a montage of overlapping primary, secondary, and tertiary memories. Goes on to note, quote, in all its forms would then be always a sort of rushing montage of frozen images. And I chose this quote to kind of um, maybe describe in some way um, Peck's work video work. From the simplest juxtaposition to the greatest art of the scenarist, according to the quality of the consciousness and the nature of the object presented to it, and according to the criteria, the secondary memories, i.e. the experiences it evokes from the object. The act of recall in the age of technological media, in other words, shuttles between primary and secondary retention. 
Yet the sense that both exist in their originary form is only possible because of the fundamental structure constituted by tertiary retention. To demonstrate how this is the case, Stiegler critically develops Husserl's phenomenology of a memory unfolding in time to include the consideration of technological media. The hearing of a melody seems to compel a kind of description proposed by the German philosopher, but the repeated hearing of the same melody recorded on technological media on what he calls a, quote, phonographic support mechanism introduces new variables in regard to the experience of time and temporality. After the second hearing of the melody, the listening consciousness has already and irreversibly changed. One knows how the melody will be phrased, when it will culminate, and how it will resolve at its conclusion. Explaining this, Stiegler writes, quote, from one hearing to another, it is a matter of different ears, precisely because the ear involved in the second hearing has been affected by the first. The same melody, but not the same ears, nor thus the same consciousness. Consciousness has changed ears, having experienced the event of the melody's first hearing. So the point is that um, with each repeated hearing of a melody, uh, consciousness changes uh, simply because um, we have a kind of anticipation of how the melody is going to unfold. Um, and so recording technology kind of embodies this condition. So if one claims to have experienced the melody differently on the second hearing, uh, the difference is accounted for by the fact that perception is always and necessarily selective. Yet as the melody is heard again, new details may be discovered and through this, it becomes more deeply inscribed in memory. Its trajectory from beginning to end becomes more deeply etched into consciousness and the gestures of the body. Uh, secondary retentions inhabit the primary experience on the second hearing and the experience of listening becomes less the discovery of a melody never heard and increasingly an expectation of its particular phrasing, culmination and resolution. The individual knows in advance that it is being heard again, that the listening experience to come will be inspired by its initial hearing. On the other hand, Stiegler states that, in fact, this way in which secondary retention always already inhabits primary retention is also the case when I've never heard it. Quote, since then, I hear from the position of an expectation formed from everything that has already musically happened to me. I'm responding to the muses guarding the default of origin of my desire within me, end quote. The experience of a recorded melody, even on its first initial hearing, is predetermined by the system of harmony, rhythm, the idea of melody, and the act of listening itself, themselves all forms of tertiary retention. Consciousness, which already knows what a melody is, itself undergoes critique through this proactive consciousness. As recording technologies increasingly determine the experience of the temporal object, so the concept of consciousness itself a temporal object becomes increasingly determined by the techniques of recording. Human consciousness itself becomes not a living entity separate from the presumptively non-living melody, but instead one with it, synchronized with its flow. It becomes unclear where the organic human ends and an inorganic technics begins. Stiegler's insights into tertiary retention help explain the overwhelming yet seemingly mundane experience of electronic superhighway. If this experience may be characterized as radical distraction, it is because the rapid montage of images appeals not in a manner that invites contemplative appreciation, but that allows itself to be unproblematically absorbed by the uh, observer. Familiar images flash before the person, but their brief duration uh, forecloses thoughtful consideration and careful critique. The capacity to recognize these images, such as of Florida orange groves or Iowa cornfields, is directly attributable to the archive of tertiary retention. This prosthetic archive consists of images and sounds that make up the universally understood image of Florida or Iowa, the mundane images um, that inform what may be known about each uh, US state. Moreover, electronic superhighway seems to confirm the extent to which the thinking, into which thinking the totality of the United States of America is made possible only by a consciousness that is always already technical. 
for beyond the question of whether presenting a large uh, map of the United States as art is a sign, symbol, representation, or simply a found object. Peck extends the scope of this question, initially raised by Johns, to illustrate how national consciousness is itself formed through tertiary retention. Even though one may have never been to North Dakota or Alabama, the act of recognizing the montages Peck presents, standing in for those states, indicates that one somehow knows these unknown places and thus draws from a base of recorded sounds and images that are perceived to originate from nowhere. Indeed, this unlocatable and forgotten archive embodies the myth of America and constitutes a legacy that is bestowed onto us as seemingly unmediated. A form of knowledge that is underpinned by tertiary memory through and through, yet that is creative and full of possibility, was perhaps envisaged by Peck when he first introduced the term electronic superhighway in 1974 in a proposal he wrote for the Rockefeller Foundation. Peck writes that communication networks spanning the United States, quote, will cease to be an ersatz, substitute, or lubricant, but will become the springboard of an unexpected new human activities. In the exhibition catalog for his show at the 1993 Venice Biennale, Peck claimed that Bill Clinton stole my idea, specifically regarding the possibility of reconnecting that, that um, book is this, uh, of connecting, quote, New York and Los Angeles with a multi-layer broadband communications networks, thus foreseeing the emergence of the internet. Today, one might reflect on the extent to which tertiary retentional technologies such as YouTube and Netflix have quickly come to dominate how we experience temporal objects, melodies, and moving images. Electronic superhighway seems to explore how the logic of the network has given rise to new human activities and possibilities, specifically the ways in which human memory has been expanded through the internet as the latest and now most important prosthetic of consciousness. If electronic superhighway concerns the network of moving images and sounds that constitute the mythical totality of American identity, Megatron Matrix attempts to imagine a network that contains particular local images yet also belong to an archive of tertiary memory that is cosmopolitan and global. Its scope is nearly as monumental as electronic superhighway, standing over three meters high and 10 meters wide, featuring two large blocks of screens juxtaposed to each other, one rectangular group of 15 by 10 monitors on the left, Megatron, and another square of eight by eight monitors on the right, Matrix. Like the kinetic montages, Featured in Global Groove, Megatron is made up of a series of images shown in a loop of about 20 minutes in duration. They include hand-drawn animals and characters appropriated from Korean animation, footage from Merce by Merce by Peck, live action video composited from layers of computer graphics, snippets of athletes playing various sports from the 1988 Seoul Olympics, Charlotte Mormon playing the cello, and animated clips of traditional folk dancing. Korean folk dancing. Although each screen may feature a single video channel, most of these images are constituted and move across the entire bank of monitors, creating a spectacular effect whereby each screen, each like a pixelated element, contributes to generating images that are larger than life. As is true of Peck's vi other video montages, fast cutting, kineticism, and the gestural body are underscored producing a mesmerizing effect on the viewer. The frenetic music that accompanies the images is partially adopted from the soundtrack to Global Groove, but adds references to traditional Korean drumming and modern trotu, uh, pop music. Most striking are the series of national flags that periodically materialize and appear on the Megatron screens. Countries such as Canada, Germany, Italy, Sweden, and Korea are represented, recalling the athletic competition between nations that take place during the Olympic Games. Their appearance seems to express the idea that Korea is one among other cosmopolitan industrialized nations and whose particular culture should be considered in the repertoire of world culture. At the time Megatron Matrix was produced, South Korea was struggling toward modernity and democratization it was beginning to emerge as a potential economic player on the global market. 
Peck was certainly aware of how the rise of Korean Chebol corporatism and events such as the Seoul Summer Olympics would raise the country's profile in the world. In 1988, the year the Olympics took place as a global media event, he created The More the Better, a towering 60 foot tall installation piece consisting of 1,003 televisions that is now featured at the National Museum of Contemporary Art. Further, he organized a global broadcast of a 47 minute video piece called Wrap Around the World, which was estimated to have been seen by 50 million viewers in more than 10 countries, taking the aesthetics and scope of global groove even further the video features Brazilian dancing, Kung Fu demonstrations, and an orchestral performance of music by Brahms, in addition to performances by uh, David Bowie, uh, Ryuchi uh, Sak Sakamoto, and Merce Cunningham. The imagery featured in the smaller Matrix section of his 1990 piece is loosely related to that in Megatron, but seems to pursue other, perhaps more abstract aims. The TV monitors are positioned so that they form a swirl around the center, and the images that appear on them emphasize patterns of geometric movement rather than presenting recognizable representations. The screens are coordinated so that they change in kaleidoscopic arrangements, recalling what Siegfried Krakauer calls uh, the mass ornament. Like the synchronized legs of the dancing Tiller girls referenced throughout his 1927 essay, the patterns produced by the synchronized screens of matrix, quote, consists of lines and circles like those found in textbooks on Euclidean geometry and also incorporate the elementary components of physics such as waves and spirals. Yet the shapes and vague human features represented in matrix culminate not in a meaning that must be uncovered through sustained interpretation, but a critique of late capitalism that is made discernible to the attuned viewer. Krakauer writes that the patterns delineated in the mass ornament are devoid of sexuality. Quote, they are a linear system that no longer has any erotic meaning, but at best points to the locus of the erotic. At the center of the vortex of the matrix section is a single screen that shows a looped clip of two partially nude women interacting with each other. The hermetically empty patterns delineated by the surrounding screens seem to rotate around this locus of the erotic, depicting soft core porn. With its representation of sexuality at the center, one might read Matrix as representing the unconscious to the conscious psyche depicted in the Megatron section. One might thus interpret the wild melange of signs presented in Megatron as expressions of repressed illicit desire. Although such readings reinforce the notion that all signifiers of consciousness point to the truth of sexuality, this psychoanalytic insight gives way only to another signifier in Matrix Megatron, another video images, another video image. For our purpose, the questions of nationhood and belonging in the age of tertiary memory persist and reiterate themselves as in the looped video of this video piece. What does it mean for Namjoon Pak to feature imagery and the flag of his birth in Megatron Matrix after four decades of not living there, after observing its political turmoil and economic rise from afar through technological media? How does the national particularity and ethnic specificity of Korea become part of universal humanity in the age of tertiary memory? To address these questions, and I, I apologize for this, but let me return briefly to Stiegler who interrogates the legitimacy of saying I and we against the backdrop of an increasingly hegemonic and thus universalizing retentional structure determined by technological media. He begins with the premise that, quote, an I claiming to make rational and universalizable statements would always be able to say we. And this is precisely what we do in this context, asking us whom we are speaking of and in the name of what or whom we allow ourselves to speak in its, her, or his name. To say I, as Stiegler reminds us, means to implicitly adopt a metaphysics of universality by speaking on behalf of the universal human, a concept that is assumed to have rights, obligations, and entitlements. In turn, this metaphysics 
legitimates the capacity for one who says I to also claim the we and to speak on behalf of other speaking humans in a universal manner. Yet a critical question arises from these Kantian premises. What are the epistemological conditions under which this ethical claim toward universality uh, may be legitimized? Who is allowed to be rational and speak on behalf of the we? For Stiegler, language is always already constituted through an archive of memories that were not in fact experienced by individual consciousness, such that we are born into a world of already existing languages, cultures, and civilizational schemas. This techniques of worlding implicates consciousness in a cycle of repetition and expectation of pastness and, and futurity, the one determining the other throughout the lifespan of the finite human. Such a techniques of the self can be extended moreover to describe the techniques of the community more broadly. A community of human beings habituated to technical consciousness may be defined in the way it attunes itself toward a shared communal duty embodied in the concept of nationhood or a civilizational form. To speak on behalf of such a community, one that can say we, means then to identify and take responsibility for the nation's past and for its configurations yet to come. Quote, the unification process of a we, Stiegler writes, is an identification, an organization, and a unification of diverse elements of the community's past as they project its future. A person belongs to a community by identifying with its techniques, embodying the temporality inaugurates on behalf of its people and thus taking responsibility for its destiny. As we have seen, this retentional structure is always already one with the techniques of film and video, both mediums of time that unfold and are experienced as temporal phenomena. Temporal objects organize the experience of time for the viewer, the one who says I, whose time consciousness is synchronized with a global we through the experience of technological media. It shows us how to remember through repetition, reminding us of the human that we are, and teaches us how to pretend and confront the future. In no other time in human history has the presence of the temporal object wirelessly streamed to smartphones, tablets, and computers been more ubiquitous than today. Yet because of this condition in an age dominated by the electronic highway of the internet, the critique of techniques has become increasingly urgent, a critique that Peck's work makes visible to us. As a kind of consciousness constituted through video images, Megatron Matrix calls attention to how nationality itself exists merely as a signifier within a global archive of national identities an archive that is grounded in the techniques of film and video. What counts as rational and universalizable today must adhere to this logic, uh, one that diverges in many ways from the aims and scope of enlightenment reason, but is constituted in the reproducibility, exchangeability, and manipulatability of electronic moving images. This logic, of course, is quantifying and objectifying, concerned less with the uniqueness and historicity of the work of art and more with its capacity to circulate and be recognized by audiences who live in South Korea, as well as by those who have never visited the country. The only way in which Korean specificity may thus be universalizable today is in the form of moving image technology and the habits of tertiary memory it inaugurates. Indeed, we recognize this form whenever we speak of the soft power the K-pop, K-dramas, and other popular images and sounds of Korea represent to the world. That we can recognize them as such indicates the extent to which these images as temporal objects have become accommodated to the habits and patterns of global tertiary memory. This form has always already constituted the metaphysics of the community who consumes this media and of the we that names it. By creating Megatron Matrix, Peck reminds himself what it means to be a Korean from afar. It gestures toward an identity that is always already implicated within tertiary retention, an identity that is both particular and yet speaks on behalf of universal humanity through the medium of video. Although he had not lived in Korea for four years and had been an American citizen for 20, Megatron Matrix expresses the experience of memory of being Korean 
and identifying with its temporality as an act of long distance recall. Thank you.